All right, I'm going to get started here. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to one of our Nature Virtually Everywhere programs here with the Forest Preserve District of King County. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is a program that, where you can enjoy nature in the comforts of your own home. And if you enjoy tonight's program, please feel free to go to our website at caneforest.com after the program and see what other virtual programs we have to offer. Most of them are free, and we also are offering uh, socially distant uh, field-based programs now for the public and for schools. So hope to see you at another program after this, either in the field or virtually. Uh, tonight, I am really happy to welcome our guest speaker, Adam Cruiser. Adam is a delegate with the International Dark Sky Association, and he's involved with a lot of other volunteer activities in his community, which is Wheaton, Illinois. Um, Adam is going to be sharing uh, what he knows about dark skies, uh, what uh, light pollution is, and how we can work to, uh, to reduce light pollution in our own neighborhoods, in our own homes. And I'm going to share uh, some data with you on the impact of light pollution on our local wildlife and plant communities. Uh, we would like this to be as interactive as possible. So we'll, at the end of the presentation, we'll monitor the chat room and we'll try to address all of your questions before we run out of time. So if you've got anything that you, uh, that you would like to ask as we're going through the talk, please make a note to us in that chat room. You can pull it up by hovering your cursor down at the bottom and clicking on chat and that window will open. A couple of other little housekeeping things. Uh, I have muted everyone on arrival because we are recording the session and that makes for a better quality video if we don't have the audios on. Uh, and you all have control of your own cameras. So uh, unless you want your lovely face to show up on our video recording, I'd suggest flipping off your own videos on your end. Uh, you can see Adam and I up top. Um, I think that's about it uh, in, in terms of just the background and Details for running tonight's program will be with you from seven to eight. If we run a little bit over because there's a lot of chat questions, Adam has agreed to stay a little, little bit over time if uh, we've got some real interesting conversations going on. But otherwise, without further ado, I think I would like to turn it over to Adam and start. Uh, Adam, would you like to give a little introduction first before I <laughs> come over to the screen share? Absolutely. Yeah, hi, Barb. Hi. Are you getting any feedback? I'm getting a little feedback. Okay, now it's now it's resolved. Um, yeah, hello everybody. Thanks for joining us. I understand there might be as many as 20, 30,000 of you watching tonight, which is terrific. Um, love to have a great audience. So we're going to talk a little bit about light pollution, otherwise known as artificial light at night. Um, we're going to talk about what it is. We're going to talk about um, the consequences of light pollution, and Barb's going to focus this this webinar is going to focus on the consequences on our wildlife and plants. Um, so Barb's going to address that some of the consequences of light pollution, and then I'm going to um, more or less address with all of you what we can do as individuals to address light pollution, whether as an advocate um, or you know just with our homes and our garages and so on and so forth. So. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover. I expect we're probably going to take 50 to 60 minutes. And again, if you can wait until we're finished um, for your questions, I'm, I'm going to stick around as long as we need to to try to answer them. And hopefully I'm going to answer them well. So I am your local IDA delegate. I don't know if anybody knew that. Probably not. Um, um, so I am here to speak on behalf of the International Dark Sky Association. Um, I have a little bit of experience with other environmental issues. I was the, Glen, the chairman of the Glen Ellen Environmental Commission for 10 or more years, and we did some great things there. And when I left, I decided to become a delegate. So um, I think we're ready to go with our slide presentation, Barb. Very good. All right. So there's our first slide. Um, as you can see, we can see the Milky Way on it and uh, it's got the International Dark Sky Association logo on it. I just want to emphasize to everybody before I forget because I usually do. Um, if there's one thing 
I would encourage you to all do, um, and the viewers of this webinar after it's posted on YouTube, please visit the International Dark Sky Association webpage, which is www.darksky.org. You're gonna learn so much more. You're gonna have a lot of fun, um, tremendous opportunities to become even more educated than, than what you might um, get from me and Barb tonight. So, and Barb's controlling the slides tonight, so I don't mess it up, which is always a good thing. So, Barb, let's go to the next one. Um, the IDA is a global organization um, since 1988. Um, it's been a nonprofit. It is the recognized authority throughout the world, recognized authority on light pollution. It is the leading organization combating light pollution worldwide. You might see in a lot of videos or whatever um, that sometimes people reference you know, international dark sky and certified dark sky parks and things of that, that nature. That's what I am. That's what we are. And we've been doing this since about 1988. The IDA currently reaches 51 countries. Um, I think we've added maybe seven or 10 different locations. I think currently we've got about 140 to 145 IDA dark sky certified places, which include municipalities, dark sky parks, and a host of other things. Um, the primary goal of the IDA is to reduce light pollution and to promote responsible outdoor lighting. We're all about outdoor lighting. We're not here to address indoor lighting. Um, uh, promote responsible outdoor lighting that is beautiful, healthy, and functional, which we can all have. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so Barb and I thought we'd start with this slide because uh, it shows dramatically the increase in light pollution over time. The problem with light pollution is a recent problem. Uh, for the most part, it's been a problem for not more than 100 years and more specifically for about 50 years. So you can see um, that we have here a slide that takes us back to 1950. We've got a slide that takes us to 1970 to 1997. And if we continue with the current uh, progress, explosion of light pollution, um, you'll see that uh, you know, it's, it's more or less gonna overwhelm all of us, certainly here in North America by calendar year 2025. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's interesting too on this slide, Adam, is that even the areas that don't have houses or structures in the middle of Lake Michigan, for instance, there is light pollution that is invading, you know, trespassing from other areas. Right, and that's, that's what, 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 that, what that is is sky glow. Um, and, and of course, trespass and glare across the lake, especially. I'm sure you saw yeah. that up in Lake Superior lately. Yeah. Um, so um, as there's more and more and more lights, and right now, most of the light pollution is from street lamps and from uh, parking lots. Um, uh, auto dealers, you might uh, see from time to time, have these horrendous uh, yeah. light fixtures and light bulbs. But more than ever, um, we are contributing to the problem. We as residential homeowners. So as we, as we uh, move from LED, uh, uh, um, sodium lights to LEDs, this is, you can see, this is just exploding. And of course it's, it's spreading across the country um, exponentially. So let's go to the next one. Um, Barb, you might want to share with some people where you just were um, uh, and what you were able to see. But uh, unfortunately for most of us here at least, and I'm sure with our audience of tens of thousands, um, you know, we, we, we can't see the Milky Way. With the IDA, we kind of use the, uh, the, the Milky Way as a marker. You know, we want to we try to set an example for everybody about what you would like to be able to see. And unfortunately, a lot of us have never seen the Milky Way because we just haven't had the opportunity to do it in our lifetime. But um, um, uh, we, we can't see the Milky Way. Only two out of 10 people on the earth can actually see the Milky Way. And 90, as you could see from that uh, uh, slide previously, um, right now, um, about 99% of North America, especially the United States of America is overwhelmed with light pollution. All the, all the stars that we can see, when you do go outside and you do look at the night sky, all the stars that you're seeing are from our Milky Way. Um, 
a little bit of astronomy, if you don't mind, I'm gonna read this. Uh, our sun is one star, just one star, in a disk shape of several hundred billion stars, otherwise known as our Milky Way galaxy. We're just one star amongst billions of stars in our galaxy. Um, on any given night, we should be able to see with our naked eye, thousands of stars. So for example, when I grew up, um, I could see thousands of stars as I would walk out the back door at my home in Michigan where I grew up. But incredibly, where I am at least, and where maybe some of you are, we can only see as maybe, maybe as many as 31 to 40 stars on the best of nights. Um, so uh, I'm gonna presume that we're not one of the lucky ones with respect to being able to see the Milky Way here. Bart, can we move to the next one? Yes. So I just thought uh, to the extent that some of you haven't seen it, um, I just thought I'd show a couple slides that demonstrate a night sky. Uh, this, this picture was, was taken in Iowa, which is not too far away from us. And you can see, of course, the Milky Way, you know, more or less rising from the barn out in the field. Um, Barb, I, I don't know what you were able, were you able to see quite a bit up in the porcupines recently? Um, yeah, I was sharing with Adam before everyone got on that this past weekend, I was backpacking in the Porcupine Mountain Wilderness on the shores of Lake Superior in Michigan, and I was able to see the Milky Way there, uh, but not quite as dramatic as this picture shows. It was not quite as um, large or as bright. Yeah, incredible. You would think we'd, we'd be able to see it tremendously well. So let's yeah. just go to another slide here. Uh, so that's that's a picture of the Milky Way as it kind of expands across the sky and you can see some mountains um, at ground level. And, and a, this is a Bortle II sky um, to the extent that some of you are astrophotographers and things of that nature, you might have heard this already, but the IDA kind of grades night skies from one to 10 and we're more or less in the night in, 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 a, in a grade nine, which is horrific. But this is what you would see if you were in a very dark sky. You can actually see the colors that come with the Milky Way. And then Barb, if we can just see one more. And I threw this in just recently because I don't know if some of you were doing it, but I certainly was. I spent like four nights outside with my wife and we just were watching and watching and watching and watching, waiting to see Neowise, the comet. Um, this picture was taken out in Utah, and of course you can see not just the comet, but the beautiful night sky and the thousands of stars that can be seen with that. So let's, let's move on to light pollution and what that is. Uh, again, light pollution is a relatively recent phenomena, um, and it is getting more and more worse uh, with the um, um, movement development into LED lighting. Uh, it typically comes in three forms, and that's what we're going to more or less address tonight. Uh, sky glow, glare, and trespass are, are basically the three light pollution forms that we're going to address. So Barb, again, if you could just... So sky glow. I, I'm sure, you know, I'm looking out my window of my office right now, and I can see some sky, low, sky glow right now. Um, all of you can see sky glow, sky glow every night. Um, sky glow is, is um, it's, it's basically misdirected light. So um, anytime you have light shining up or out, it gets, it gets captured by the atmosphere. And as a result of that, it's, it just explodes um, throughout the atmosphere and expands throughout the atmosphere, especially when it's cloudy. I don't know if any of you noticed, but on cloudy nights, um, light pollution is, is significantly worse. It's almost a bright night with the cloud cover. Um, <clears throat> and sky glow is, uh, for the most part, wasted light. Um, we should be keeping our light directed down, which we'll talk about or we'll talk about a little bit later. So in this slide, as you look to the right, you can see sky glow a little bit more. But as we move to the left in this slide, 
you can see that there's less sky glow. Um, so sky glow is basically the most significant problem with respect to astronomers and, and, and us here on the ground to be able to see the stars. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, for us on the ground, um, more obnoxiously, we deal with glare and with light trespass. And like sky glow, we're confronted with glare almost every night. Some glare is much more intrusive and obnoxious than other glare. Um, but again, the recent use of LED lights has greatly accelerated that. Um, much of the glare that we have, again, is just from wasted lights. Um, for example, from our neighbors shining into our yard or whatever the case may be. Let's go into the next slide. So what, what does glare cause? Um, faced with bright lights, and this is kind of applicable to what um, Barb's gonna be talking about later with wildlife. Um, faced with white bright lights, which is basically what we're being confronted with with LEDs, our, our pupils um, contract and the iris closes to basically protect um, the pupil, our eye. As a result, everything else starts to appear dark. 40% um, of Americans live in such a wash of electric light and glare that their eyes never transition to night vision, which is just incredible to me. Um, normally in more dimly light, situ uh, situ uh, more dimly light situations, our pupil will expand. You know, kind of like you might see in your mirror, for example, or with your cat or your dog or something to that effect. And when our, when our pupil expands, in other words, when our iris relaxes, we can see as much as 30 times more light, um, uh, 30 times more light enters our eye. Um, so we're able to just adjust to the night sky. So um, glare is causing the pupil to constrict, it's reducing our field of vision, and it's reducing our reaction time. We can see the next slide. And that really comes into uh, the question of whether light is more safe. Um, and I encourage all of you to kind of do this at your own homes with a, maybe a fixture that you have at your home or, or maybe your neighbor has at your home. Um, you can see at the top of the slide that we have a, a, a fixture that is not guiding the light down. So the light's basically just shining out at us. Our eyes focus on that light to the detriment of everything else around it. So we're not able to see what else is around us. Our eye is just constricting to the light that's shining at us. But when we put our hand over that light and our light, our, our pupils start to adjust to that light not being focused into our eyes, our pupils start to expand, they start to open, and we start to accept more light our photoreceptors start to accept more light. And you can see that we can then see that, that, uh, that gentleman who's been standing at the door of the fence this whole time. So um, more light is a myth. More light does not provide you with more safety. Better light provides you with more safety. You want your pupils to be able to see all of what is in your environment at any given time. You don't wanna be blinded by your own lights. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And light trespass, it's, it's more or less, um, you know, uh, uh, consistent with glare. And I don't know if, if any of you have this problem, I know I do. And it's one of the reasons I kind of became a delegate jealously. Um, some of you might have neighbors um, that have new LED lights, especially white LED lights. And these lights stream and shine into our home, um, into our bedrooms. Um, in my humble opinion, uh, light should stay on our own properties. Uh, it should not trespass onto our neighbor's property. Any more than our neighbor's light should trespass onto our property. You know, we don't, we don't want to spill our water 
onto our neighbor's property. We don't want to have the chemicals that we might put into our lawn spill into our neighbor's property any more than we want their water and chemicals to spill into our property. Light trespass is a form of pollution. It's a form of trespass. Um, so uh, whether that light is shining up or it's shining out, what we want to try to do is address that, that trespass and eliminate the glare that's now going to be coming into our rooms and so on and so forth. So um, if you can, I'd like all of you to kind of look at your own little neighborhood and think about how maybe you can reduce the trespass that you might be sharing with your neighbors. So let's go to the next light. And if, uh, the next slide, and of course, light trespass affects everybody, um, uh, wildlife too. As Barb will chat with us about. So, um, what are what are some of the light pollution consequences? Um, we can go to the next slide, Barb. Um, for all of us, um, anytime we have a light on, uh, we're wasting energy. Maybe, arguably. Um, so, uh, poorly designed lighting, um, poorly designed outdoor lighting specifically, it's a huge waste of energy. It's a huge waste of money. If we go to the next slide, Barb. Three to seven billion dollars is spent every year on unneeded lighting. That's a lot of money that's spent every year on unneeded lighting. and. With that, of course, comes uh, more greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the wasted light in the United States has been calculated to uh, basically result in 21 million tons of uh, greenhouse gases um, that were just spilling out into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. which of course is affecting climate change dramatically. And for us, keeping that light on outdoors um, maybe not having that light on a dimmer, maybe not having that light on a timer. Um, it's costing us money too. Um, the cost of burning just one bulb every night during the year is, is a significant amount of money. So um, we're wasting energy, we're wasting money. That's a consequence of light pollution. If we can go to the next one, please. So I'm gonna just talk about human health a little bit before Barb dives into wildlife and plants. Um, you know, apart from not being able to see the night sky and a lot of IDA junkies are astronomers uh, and, and people that take photographers and they're just thinking exclusively about, you know, what stars can I see, what planets can I see? But more dramatically and more significantly, light pollution is affecting everything that lives on our planet, including our own human health. And we've known this for quite a few years now. Basically, the effect on our human health starts and ends with um, a hormone known as melatonin, which some of you maybe have heard of. You can take mel melatonin supplements to help you sleep. Well, you know, right now we're addressing how, how you can allow your melatonin to flow through your body. How do you do that? You turn off the lights, you reduce your exposure to lights. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, melatonin is the hormone that regulates your sleep-wake cycle, which is otherwise known as your circadian rhythm. And like all animals, and we're animals, humans, everything has a circadian rhythm. It's, it's something that's developed over the generations and generations and the thousands and thousands and thousands of years that animals have been here on the earth, including us, okay, for a shorter period of time, to what has always been the situation until just very recently. We have day and we have night. And because we have night, our bodies, the, the bodies of other animals, our wildlife friends, have basically created a hormonal system that allows us to function better as human beings, better as animals. 
if we can go to the next slide. So this is just for um, all of you. I'm not gonna dwell too much on this article. This is a um, release from the American Medical Association. I, I'd like to think that uh, most of you have heard of the American Medical Association from June of 2016 that addresses the consequences of light pollution and specifically the circadian rhythm. Recent research has shown that um, the decrease in melatonin, which can happen just from an exposure to a small insignificant amount of light at night, artificial light at night, can now actually cause cancers, um, a contributing cause of cancers. And, um, and, and most importantly, I think, especially now that we're dealing with COVID, a significant effect on our autoimmune systems. And that is also playing a role with other types of life forms. What affects melatonin most, and whether that hormone is gonna be released naturally by our body during night, is blue light. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Blue light is most specific to LEDs now. Um, we've been having sodium lights for a long period of time, but now we're being confronted with LED lights, which have blue light. And you can see from this article, I don't know to the extent that all of you are reading it, but the ADA basically has said that the introduction of blue light, especially through street lamps and things of that nature, is affecting our health. And because we're kind of centric with respect to wildlife with this seminar, I just wanted to read a paragraph that's not highlighted. The AMA, 19, uh, the, the AMA June 14, 2016. The detrimental effects of high intensity LED lighting are not limited to humans. Excessive outdoor lighting disrupts many species that need a dark environment. For instance, poorly designed LED lighting disorientates some birds, insects, turtles, and fish species. And the US national parks have adopted optimal lighting designs and practices that minimize the effects of light pollution on the environment. This is from 2016. We've known about this for some period of time. And basically what, what the AMA recommended was that for um, municipalities, think twice about the types of bulbs that you're using. Get rid of that blue light. Go to a different light within the spectrum of lights that are uh, the, the, the spectrum of light that's available with the LEDs. Incredibly, 70 million, uh, and this is from recent research, 70 million Americans, that's a lot of people, currently suffer from disorders of sleep and wakefulness. And 60% of that 70 million have a chronic sleep disorder. I think with the research that's being developed, and there's a lot of research that's going on now, whereas it hadn't been, um, been going on um, in the past, I think what we're gonna find out is most of our sleep disorders are caused by the introduction of significant light pollution and the effect that that has on our melatonin. So if we can go to the next slide. So um, typically I would go through um, some slides that address the ecological impacts, including impacts to wildlife, but Barb and I decided that it would be more exciting if she did it. So, Barb, I think you're up. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try to live up to that excitement factor. So let's, uh, we'll shift from, uh, Adam shared some really good information about light pollution's impact on humans as one animal, but as a naturalist with the Forest Preserve District and a manager in the Environmental Ed Department, I'm very interested in sharing with you some of the effects that light pollution have on our wildlife and plants that we have in our natural areas and you even have in your own yards or along the roads that we drive on. So uh, as, as diurnal creatures, we humans are active during the day. We might not think as much about what's going on at night, but there's a whole nother world out there, the nocturnal world that's 
that's carrying on when we're asleep, if we don't have a sleep disorder. Uh, animals are specially adapted to, uh, to thrive in the darkness. They have different features that make it easy for them to see and do many other activities when it's dark. Some of the things that nocturnal animals uh, rely on and do well when in conditions of low light are forage and hunt. So uh, at night, uh, there is less uh, chance of being predated if you're a prey animal. Most more uh, predators are out during the daylight hours than in the evening. And for hunting, there's not as much competition if you're a predator. At nighttime, there are some animals that are specially adapted to find and select mates using cues that can only be seen at night. And we're gonna talk about some specific, some specific species in each of these categories in a minute. Uh, other activities going on in the nighttime world are some plants only flower in the evening, believe it or not, and are pollinated at night by um, species that have co-evolved with them to uh, specifically pollinate their flowers in the evening hours. Migration. Uh, a large percentage of our songbirds and, and other birds migrate in the evening. Uh, that's because there are fewer predators at night and especially in the warmer climates, it's cooler in the evening. So it's not as dangerous to migrate at night as it is during the day. Now some specific adaptations that animals have for doing well in the evening, if they're foraging and hunting, uh, this is the skull of an owl. And you can see that the eyes of an owl are very, very large in comparison to the skull size. If we were to have the same ratio of eyes on our head, our eyes would be the size of a grapefruit. We often use the little um, cardboard cutout to illustrate that to children. When the eyes are so large, they let in a lot more light. Uh, owls don't have very good color vision, but they have excellent vision in dim light. And it allows them to find their prey uh, and hunt very effectively in the evening. Owls also have uh, the ability to turn their head, not all the way around, but 270 degrees either way, because instead of having seven vertebrae in their neck, like we do, we can only turn about a quarter of the way, they have 14 vertebrae. So that combined with their excellent eyesight makes them really effective nighttime hunters. On the courtship and mating side, I think the, the poster child of the nocturnal world in the Chicago area especially, is the firefly. Uh, it's not a bug and it's not a fly, it's actually a, a true bug, um, a member of the beetle family, but fireflies find mates and um, find the species that they want to mate with, with this bioluminescent lamp that is only, is only visible to a potential partner in the evening. Uh, as I mentioned, particular species of insects are uh, very specialized to pollinate specific flowers at night. This is a hawk moth. Hawk moth has a, a great adaptation to be able to slow down uh, its brain, to shut parts of its brain down in the evening. So it's very effective at finding the flowers that it needs at night while still being able to, to fly and, and run all of its other body processes in the evening. And lastly, migration. A lot of birds are migrating at night for reasons that I already mentioned, and they uh, use celestial cues, the position of the moon and the stars to help them navigate, as well as magnetic and even cues of smell. But it's that, um, that celestial uh, issue that is, makes it so important to them in the evening. And when there's light pollution, it makes it difficult for them to find their way. Yeah, and Barb, you know, it's funny, you know, we, we've developed as human beings, we've, we've developed navigation tools mm. right, because of technology, yeah. but wildlife and birds who still navigate by, by night don't have the benefit of that. They're still, no. dependent, they're still dependent on those stars. That, that's absolutely right. As well as other, um, you know, issues, we have uh, some nocturnal birds that aren't migrating but are just active at night. They're out there hunting and we'll talk about some of the impacts that light pollution has on those non-migrating nocturnal birds because they have problems as well. 
So um, with all of this activity going on the e in the evening, scientists have long known that animals are dependent on food, water, and shelter to thrive and to do well. But only very recently have, uh, have studies been made into the really big impact that darkness has on the, uh, the health and the success of wildlife. And this term scotobiology, which is basically the study of the biology of darkness, it's a fascinating new term, and it is new, uh, was coined in an article uh, from 2003. So this is a relatively new field of study. Um, it was a, an article that was written by a German scientist uh, or a German convention. And after the term was coined, uh, the, the, the concept of scotobiology or studying the biology of darkness started to make its way into more of the popular press. Uh, this is actually a really wonderful book. I've only um, completed part of it, but uh, we'll give you some resources at the end of the talk of further reading, and this is definitely one I'd recommend. Ecological Consequences of Artificial Night Light. It's an adult book, uh, but it's easy reading and it's got some great data on the impact of darkness on um, both wildlife and plants. This book, the one on the left, would came out just a few years after that 2003 conference, but more recently in 2017, the, the concept of darkness matters and scotobiology has made its way into children's literature with the um, publication in 2017 of this uh, book for youth. And even for you music uh, hounds in the group, there is a CD that came out uh, from a jazz trio in Brooklyn, New York, uh, a couple years ago called Scotobiology. And I, I, I just ordered that Dark Matters book and it looks like a tremendous book for even adults too. It's about 70 yeah. pages and it's really good. It's a great primer. Often I find for a subject that you're just starting to learn about, children's books are the best place to start. Yeah, but it is for adults too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, scotobiology. So with the importance that scientists are now recognizing that darkness plays in terms of human health, animal health, and plant health, um, it, it only makes sense that they have also started to study the impact of light pollution on those species. And Adam talked a bit about the, the human health impact, but I'd like to share with you some more specific stories about how a light pollution or artificial light does impact uh, specific species of wildlife. So um, there are five uh, categories of impact that light pollution does have on wildlife. And the first is, uh, is impact in orientation. Moths are attracted to, to porch lights. Birds are attracted to lit up skyscrapers. Both of these scenarios result in the, the animal being disoriented and confused and not being able to navigate or find prey like they normally would without that light pollution impacting the night. Second type of uh, category uh, of light pollution impact is on predation. So for um, animals that, uh, you know, that hunt at night and best when it's dark, um, they, they are out hunting for less amount of time if there is light impeding or light impacting of the period that it should be dark so they're not catching as much food. For prey animals, they have less time to be out there and forage in the evening hours that they prefer where there's not as many predators out. So the, um, the mortality rates increase. Competition, uh, the animals that like to, to hunt in the evenings like owls, uh, coyotes, uh, they, they face increased numbers of animals out there hunting if the night is lighter than it should be. Animals that wouldn't typically be uh, hunting are competing with those that do well, that do best in the evening hour hunts. Reproduction, we talked about the firefly specifically. There are some animals that, that use the cover of darkness for their sexual activity, and if they can't find a mate because they can't see the mate, then the uh, reproduction numbers go down and species numbers go down. Yeah, there's been a dramatic decrease in fireflies. I'm sure probably everybody here has noticed that. Yeah, and, and insects in general, but we, you know, we all love fireflies in the Midwest and they're so prototypical of summer that yeah, we noticed that. 
Um, Adam mentioned circadian rhythms uh, being tied to melatonin levels. I mean, as a as humans, we have evolved over millions of years. So have our wildlife. Uh, they they've evolved to to have certain activities and certain processes going on uh, depending on how long the day and the night cycles are. Well, circadian rhythms on a larger scale also impact um, pan species issues like migration. So all of these these um, these processes and features of our wildlife um, suffer when the night is not as dark as it should be or as long as it should be. So let's look at some specific species. Um, if you were to think of one animal, one wild animal that's active in the evening other than the firefly, a lot of folks would say bats. But a lot of people are afraid of bats. So uh, this is a little brown bat, it's a common a bat in Kane County, but I want to tell you that you really should care about bats. Bats are important for us. Um, bats pollinate several of our fruits and flowers. Um, they, uh, especially in the tropical areas, this is the case, but here um, we have some bat pollination activity, not as much as in other areas. However, here many of our, um, uh, the insect pests that we uh, are annoyed by, think mosquitoes, um, insects that destroy crops, that cause disease. This is the bat's diet. Bats are out there using their sonar to find insects. So if we don't like a lot of mosquitoes and a lot of other insects annoying us, then we like bats. The impact of light pollution on bats is, is an interesting one. Uh, there are no other reports uh, that I found that indicate that any other nocturnal animal faces this first issue of barotrauma. So uh, wind, turbine lights off, wind turbines often have lights on them. We have quite a few wind turbine um, fields. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's, it's, you know, it's alternative clean energy. But the fact is that Bats are often attracted to the lights on these wind turbines. They fly close and as the blades are spinning, they create uh, decreases, steep decreases in atmospheric pressure. So as the bats get close to those turbines, they get something similar to the bends in the scuba diver, which is barotrauma, and their lungs burst. So um, this is one cause of mortality of bats in the evening. And then there are some bats um, the, the smaller bats are more agile and uh, easy, uh, easier for them to turn on a dime, and they um, can be attracted and succeed uh, in feeding on insects that flock around porch lights or artificial lights. You know, picture a moth spinning around your porch light. A little bat is often able to get in there and catch that insect, but some of the larger bats that aren't quite as agile flyers can't. So the, the good flyers, the agile ones, uh, are attracted to the insects that go to the light and they can have the ability to displace those larger bats, like those big brown bats, large brown bats uh, that aren't as acrobatic. So that's bats. The next category of wildlife that um, you hear quite a bit about these days in terms of decline are insects. Uh, Insects are beautiful. This is a moth. This is a white line sphinx moth native to our area, uh, but they have more advantage to us than just being beautiful to look at. Um, insects pollinate most of our fruits and flowers. 80% of our flowering plants and 75% of our food crop crops depend on insects to pollinate and to reproduce. Um, and not all pollinators are active in the evening. However, those that are active pollinating plants at night have been shown to be more effective at transferring pollen from one plant to another. So putting that all together, those night pollinators are really, really critical to, um, to our fruits and flowers, which in turn affects our food supply. Uh, and then not just for us, but insects are a primary, primary food source for many animals. Insects are very low on the food chain. Um, especially birds and fish depend heavily on insects uh, as the, the mainstay of their diet. And not just adult insects like this adult uh, moth, 
it's the larval form of insects. Think caterpillars. Those are nice, juicy treats for birds. Yeah, birds. So most birds feed primarily on caterpillars, especially when they, you know, have their little birds in their nests. They feed yeah. those birds dozens, if not hundreds, of caterpillars every day. Um, and yeah, this, maybe this is a good point, Adam. I know you wanted to mention that Doug Talame book uh, that talks a lot about insect, the importance of insects for birds. Yeah, um, if you haven't had a chance to read the book, um, uh, Nature's Best Friend, I think it is. I can't recall the exact title of it, but you can see Doug Talame also on uh, YouTube videos all the time. He, yeah. he really explains the significance of insects, especially moths. And he also addresses the significance with every new video that I see from him. He really hits it hard mm -hmm. almost repeatedly more often the consequences of light pollution on the moths. And um, mm -hmm. of course the moths are, are responsible for most of our caterpillars that are feeding most of our birds. Our mm -hmm. moths um, and invertebra invertebrates generally, um, they're, more, they're more active at night. And the research is showing that our moths are very much responsible for the pollination, the night pollination that of course benefits our plants. Mm -hmm. also yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, I think it's nature's best hope. Um, nature's and, best hope. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah, and so, right, it's, it, they are nature's best hope. Um, and they also uh, are the best hope for cleaning our planet up of detritus. So insects, uh, as well as other arthropods like millipedes and centipedes, centipedes uh, play a major role in decomposition. So without insects and all the other uh, decomposers, we would be, you know, head high and um, and leaf litter and animal carcasses, uh, rotting things. So that's why insects are important. But insects are in trouble. Um, they are experiencing steep declines. Uh, there have been numerous articles on this and a lot of data collected about it lately. Um, I don't think most of you are surprised to hear this because we've seen things and heard of the insect apocalypse. Uh, the, um, the watershed study on the decline of insects uh, just came out in 2018. It was um, published in Science Magazine and it, or, I'm sorry, 2017. And it found that there's been a 75% decline in total insect biomass over the past 27 years. This was conducted by a group of citizen scientists in Germany. It received a lot of attention um, by scientists worldwide and was picked up by the New York Times in 2018. And they coined the term the insect apocalypse in that New York Times article. And that started to be a you know, common watchword among you know, naturalists and people that are interested in the environment and really you know, farmers, you know, anyone that likes to eat cares about insects. So the fact that we're seeing such steep declines um, is worrisome. Now, not to say that light pollution is the cause of all of this decline, but it does play a role. Um, a, a recent study uh, by Brooks Jarvis et al. in 2018 did uh, show that while things like that insects are attracted to artificial light, like the moths of the porch light, circle continually all night long, tire out and eventually die. Uh, we talked about insect prey, um, you know, being uh, prey animals having more problems when there is light pollution, higher predation rates uh, when the light isn't, when the night isn't as dark as it should be and mating signals being obscured. So all of these issues are coming into play and leading uh, along with habitat loss and pesticide use, and climate change, to the big declines in insect populations in all types of ecosystems, unfortunately. Uh, so I picked, uh, I'm gonna pick three specific insects and just give you some uh, little vignettes to, to help you understand exactly what I'm talking about. So insect um, declines can be related to direct light, like we have under the street lamp. 
We've got the firefly and the moth that I'm going to talk to you about in a second. And then lastly, they can be impacted by sky glow, which is on the far right of this picture. You can see on the bottom right, the lowly dung beetle. It's uh, got the little letter D next to it. So those are the three insects that um, go into a little bit deeper and see what happens when they are exposed to artificial light. So the hawk moth uh, that we talked about earlier, it is specialized to feed on that tubular shaped night blooming flower uh, with a very long proboscis. It's like a little long straw that dips into the tube of that flower, collects the nectar and ends up pollinating the next flower that it goes to. Um, the specialization doesn't do any good if the hawk moth can't find the flower. Uh, and in the, um, the presence of artificial light, that's what happens. The moth gets attracted to the porch light, uh, it gets disoriented, it can't find the flower, it, it gets exhausted. Uh, and a, it's been shown in this uh, article cited at the bottom that a third of these moths die before morning due to exhaustion or predation. Fireflies, uh, a little bit more biology on the firefly. Uh, the, the bioluminescent lamp on the firefly is found in both males and females. The, uh, the females tend to sit on the ground or low on the vegetation and wait for the males to circle around them and make their flash pattern. Every species of uh, firefly has a different flash pattern, uh, short or long bursts, uh, different rates and different colors from yellow to green to red. Uh, when the night is not dark enough, those signals can't be seen. The females can't recognize uh, the species that they're looking for, or they can't see the light at all. And they, uh, you know, the firefly sex patterns are disrupted and population declines. That's a chemical reaction. <clears throat> There's an enzyme called luciferase that oxidizes luciferin. And that chemical reaction can occur when the the light uh, pollution is there, but it, the resulting bioluminescence can't not be seen unless it's dark. And lastly, the dung beetle. Uh, a dung beetle is a, a ball rolling beetle that uses the cues of the moon and the stars to navigate. They pull uh, clumps of dung out of larger dung piles, move them away from the main uh, pile, navigating with the celestial cues, and bury and feed on those uh, deposits later. If there's light pollution, they can't navigate properly and they end up uh, coming back in a circle and ending back where they started, back at the main pile, uh, facing increased foraging competition and again, declines in population. So from the glamorous firefly and the beautiful moth to the lowly dung beetle, a lot of insects are impacted by light pollution. Yeah, and the research is showing that, it, that, that the light pollution is affecting these insects dramatically. As more and more research is conducted, we're finding how much light pollution is affecting these insects, yeah. which really feed the cycle of life. Yeah, they, they do. All the other higher levels of, uh, of animals depend on insects. Without the insects, we wouldn't have fruits. We wouldn't have vegetables. No, we wouldn't. <laughs> Uh, and lastly, uh, talk about birds. Um, so we've got nocturnal birds like this barred owl that are just active in the evening, but we also have migrating birds that, um, that are impacted by light pollution. Uh, but birds, you know, play an important role in our ecosystems too. They also, uh, like insects, uh, I mean, like insectivores, uh, bats eat insect pests and a lot of them they play a role in decomposition by things like turkey vultures scavenging carcasses. They hunt other things that we might not want in our yards, like rats and mice and other rodents. They disperse seeds by eating seeds and uh, scatting them out later. And they also help pollinate plants, things like hummingbirds. And they're bioindicator species. If we monitor uh, populations of birds, we see them declining, we can take that as a sign that something else is wrong in the environment and try to fix it before it impacts humans and works its way farther up the, um, up the ecosystem. 
And a lot of people really enjoy birding and it brings a lot of economic upside to many communities. If you've ever seen that movie, The Big Year, <laughs> you'll know what I'm talking about and you'll have a good laugh. But birds, uh, unfortunately, are also in trouble. Um, another famous, semi-famous in um, the Naturalist Circles article came out in Science, uh, a peer-reviewed, very prestigious scientific journal in 2019, uh, showing data that since 1970, North America has lost nearly 30% of its total bird population, or 2.9 million birds since 1970. This is um, a catastrophic loss of birds. Uh, again, not totally caused by light pollution, but impacted by light pollution. Most of the bird decline is due to habitat loss or degradation, uh, followed by invasive species like cats. Um, and climate change, but also light pollution. So uh, birds, mag or migrating birds, use celestial cues as well as magnetic, polarized light, and even smell to navigate. Uh, but with artificial light, they're just like insects, they are distracted and disoriented. Um, they, they get drawn to those lights on the high-rise buildings, uh, they get taken off course, they either die immediately by colliding with uh, bright buildings, or they lose a lot of energy, which, like a moth, they circle around those buildings, and uh, when they're circling, they have less chance of finding food and getting out and hunting insects or whatever else they need to complete their long migration journeys, and they, they're weak, so they're easier to be preyed upon. How many are we talking about? Uh, most of the birds in North America are migratory, 70%, and 80% of those migrate at night. So multiplying those together, half of all birds in North America migrate at night. That's a lot, all, half of our birds. This is especially important uh, when we consider where we live. In the Chicago area, we're right on one of the key flyways in the United States, and um, the flyways are the, these highways that the birds use to migrate from, from their wintering grounds to their breeding grounds and back again every year. And we are right there, right smack in the middle of that flyway. It's a nice spot for birds to stop. There's a lot of water here, a lot of fields to forage in. But um, one of the bad things is that we have a lot of buildings here and we do have a lot of pollution. So a, a recent study by <clears throat> Cornell, which is one of the biggest ornithology research universities in the country, show that Chicago, unfortunately, has the non-enviable position of having the most bird deaths uh, by collision in both the spring and the fall migration. So you know, this is especially important because that's right where we are right here today. But the, there is- the Number one hazardous location. Yeah. Where we live. Not a good place to be. But we can, we can do things about it. It's as simple as turning off the lights on some of these downtown high-rise buildings. And a recent study by the Field Museum uh, found that by doing so, can reduce migratory bird deaths uh, at, on one building they found by 80%. So it's a relatively simple solution. And um, I know some uh, municipalities are taking steps and Chicago uh, hopefully is taking notice too. Yeah, they have, they have a Lights Out Chicago program, and if yeah. wants to do a little research on that, there's a recent WTTD publication on that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The city of Chicago is trying to do what they can to, to reduce that light pollution with the buildings. Yeah, which is great. And lastly, just a word or two about plants. Um, why should we care about plants? Well, even those of you who aren't vegetarians, it's the food. <laughs> um, Plants are the only organism that can convert sunlight to energy, to food for themselves. And as a result, uh, all of the, um, then that's called a producer, when an organism can make its own energy from sunlight or simple, uh, simple molecules. Consumers eat the producers. So all the other um, you know, animals and organisms out there depend on plants. They are the foundation of the entire food web. Without plants, nothing else would live. Plants also supply, supply us things like cotton and timber. They, they make it possible for us to breathe by generating oxygen and water through photosynthesis. 
They improve our air quality by removing toxins and our water quality by reducing runoff. They sequester carbon. Uh, trees alone sequester 13% of all the carbon dioxide emissions in the United States. Just trees, it's a lot. Especially in this you know, area that we're in uh, with climate change, that's an important figure. And they improve our physical and mental health. There's been a lot of studies lately about going for a walk in the woods, uh, not only decreases things like uh, weight and diabetes and heart disease, but it improves uh, your mental health, reduces your anxiety, and just makes you a happier person. Plants, though, are, <clears throat> are just as dependent on darkness as they are on light. So it's the timing, the intensity, and the wavelength of light that provides cues to regulate plants. Now, most people know that plants use light as an energy source. It's what they use to start the process of photosynthesis. But light also regulates or informs a lot of their other physiological processes. Things like phenology. Phenology is uh, changes that plants go through as the seasons progress. Things like bud burst, like we have here, flowering, seed dispersal, um, all of these other things that happen in a, a normal course of a season, light informs those processes. The growth form of the plant, how tall does it get? Does it have a large crown spread? That depends on how much light it's getting. And lastly, how does it allocate resources uh, within the tissues of the plant. How much um, energy is sent to root production, for instance. All of this depends on light, the timing and intensity and the wavelength. Uh, the, the amount of light uh, isn't uh, the only thing. It's the, the length of daylight and darkness, which is photoperiodism. And it's that that really allows some plant species to switch to reproductive modes at certain times of the year. Plants, just like animals, are really synced. They have evolved to these circadian rhythms of light, uh, but in plants, it's called photoperiodism. Healthy plants love darkness. They do, <laughs> some more than others. And it's actually fascinating to think that, yes, the darkness is actually more important than the light in many plants. So you can classify all plants into three photo uh, period groups, uh, depending on which uh, amount of day and, and night length they prefer. So we have a group of plants that are called short day plants, and they prefer, well, they need, prefer is not the right word, it's critical to their flowering that they have a certain amount of night. So they need a long night or they won't flower, like this diagram on the left shows. Other types of plants, the second category is called long day plants. It's critical to them that they have a shorter night and a longer day or they won't flower. There's a third category called neutral that doesn't use photoperiod to set flower, uses other cues in the environment. But, the thing to note here is that for many plants, especially these short day plants on the left, it's not just the length of night that's important. There's a critical night length or they won't flower. It's the period of uninterrupted night length. So you can see the short day long night plant figure on the left, the furthest right column. The night is long, but there's a flash of light during the night. The plant does not flower. So it's it's that uninterrupted darkness that is critical for plants to flower. If it's so critical, it's a problem when the darkness is interrupted or it's not deeply dark to begin with as a result of light pollution. So the impact of light pollution on plants uh, is that their, their natural light cycles are disrupted, including their flowering. And this is true for plants that are growing in urban environments where they are subject to direct illumination by street lamps and car lights. Also though, in natural ecosystems like we have in our forest preserve, on the edges where there is some dark light trespass and the sky glow that occurs there. The short day plants especially, uh, if the night length is not long enough, that critical length for this plant here is 16 hours, no flowering. If there's too much um, 
you know, direct light that's simulating uh, sunlight, that is not going to reach the critical night length. Or if there are flashes of light in the middle of the night from headlights or what have you, again, no flowering. And other things too will be impacted, those phenology and growth forms that we mentioned. And lastly, uh, light pollution is impacting other things uh, in the ecosystem where the plant is growing. Uh, those, those pollinators that are subject to light pollution aren't going to be able to pollinate the plant. So it's a cycle. Nature, um, many cycles, Krebs cycle, uh, but it's one big circle of life. One thing impacts another. Yeah, and I think we all have to remember that, you know, before the explosion of light pollution, through all those millions of years, there was night and there was dark, real dark. Yeah. That wasn't affected by all this artificial light at night that we have that basically simulates yeah. sun during night. Yeah, absolutely. But there are very easy solutions. And Adam's going to take you through some of those right now um, before we're done. And um, then we'll get to, to your chat questions. So Adam, over to you. Yeah, we're already running a little bit late, so I'm not going to dwell on um, some of these first slides too much. Um, but Barb, if we can uh, move on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So to, for those of you who would like to be an advocate, um, you can certainly be an IDA uh, delegate. I'd love to have company. Um, but you can try to encourage your municipalities to be dark sky compliant. Some of you might have heard of Homer Glenn. Um, if you can move to the next slide, Barb. As we, as we kind of whistle through some of this stuff. Um, most recently, Hawthorne Woods become, it became an International Dark Sky Certified Municipality. Um, through the International Dark Sky Association webpage, there are samples of ordinances. You can take these ordinances to your environmental commissions, to whatever your governmental body might be with respect to your municipality where you live, and you want to try to encourage them to become dark sky compliant so that they're affecting the entire neighborhood. If we can go to the next slide. Um, part, of always, part of being an advocate, of, of course, is to try to approach um, organizations like the Kane County Forest Preserve um, to maybe uh, encourage them to take a park, a very nice park, that's probably dark already, mm -hmm. to um, change out the light fixtures that they might have, change out the bulbs that they might have, to basically allow them to have the opportunity to be a International Dark Sky Certified Dark Park. And uh, one of the huge benefits of that, of course, is uh, people want to go there. So there's more tourism, and with more tourism, we have more education and so on and so forth. The ball just keeps rolling. Um, so we have one dark sky park here in uh, Illinois that's down south near Champaign-Danville area. Um, we have two dark sky parks in Michigan. I don't know if there's a third or not by now. And there's a wonderful dark sky park up in Wisconsin, up at the very top of Door County. I've heard great things about that. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, again, a little bit more advocacy, but maybe more in your neighborhood. Um, when I became a delegate, I decided I'm going to try to influence what my neighbors are doing. I don't want you to read this entire letter, but I decided to focus on lightning bugs. So I prepared a letter which I hand delivered or shoved in the door if I needed to to all my neighbors to try to educate them, um, give them a little bit more information about the effects of light pollution. I focused all that with respect to, you know, the, the fireflies. And, and of course the kids love the fireflies. So the parents are all involved and everybody's, yay, what can we do? And before you know it, we've got people turning off their lights and the street is darker and everybody's doing it together. So um, we'll move to the next slide. And, and what I did is I just followed up with another letter to continue to encourage people. And uh, with that, not only did I focus on the fireflies, but I also started to introduce the moths, you know, into the equation and addressing how um, without those moths, we don't have the pollination that we would want and so on and so forth. And uh, sincerely, uh, I think 80% uh, of my neighbors reacted favorably. Some of them are going to leave their lights on. But um, it's, it's a tremendous difference, and I'm somewhat proud of it. So if we can move to the next slide. And then there are sample letters on the International Dark Sky website, too. Um, so let's go to what we can do as individuals real quick, because it is a really simple fix. Um, what we want to try to do is we want to try to make sure that um, we're, we're lighting only what we need to light. 
sometimes um, we just forget to turn the lights off. Um, we don't need those lights on. So the most significant thing you can do is just simply turn the lights off. Try to remember to do that. Um, I had, I had a, one of my neighbors was kind of funny. I said, well, you know, you got that light there in the front and uh, you shared a beer with him and we talked about it. And he said, well, you know, it's difficult for me um, to turn off the light. I said, why? He said, well, I have to do it manually. So sometimes you just have to turn that switch off. Um, and now he, all his lights are off at night. Um, targeted. If you do want your lights on at night, let's decide where we really need them. Are there some lights that are just out there because they've always been out there? Maybe you decide you don't need those lights. Um, and then of course, uh, um, we want those lights to be as less bright as possible. And we want those lights to be controlled. And that's where we kind of get into the fixtures, which we'll talk about. And we also want to use bulbs that have the, the, the right light spectrum. So let's dive into that a little bit deeper. Barb, if we can go to the next one. So here, what we have is we have this young lady with some fireflies, the lights are off, right? Number one, turn the lights off. Barb, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, apart from turning the lights off, in my humble opinion, the most important thing that all of you can do is make uh, a good lighting design decision with respect to the fixtures that you use. Um, you can hear, see here that shielding, aiming the lights down, is emphasized in this slide. And if you look to the left, and we see this all the time, you can go outside tonight and see the same thing. If we look to the left, you, you, we have this garage um, that has the lights that are not shielded down. They're shining in our eyes. We're getting the glare, we're getting the light trespass. But if we move to the right, we've got fixtures that focus that light down. We're still getting the same amount of light where we need it, but it's not shining out. It's not trespassing and we're, we're actually ultimately saving money too. So we want to have the right fixture. If we can go to the next slide. This is just an example, right? From left to right, um, where I'm looking at least, we got the worst, bad, better, best. The best is shining that light down and keeping it focused on the ground. Next slide, please. Um, this is from the uh, Home Depot near my home. You can see that there's just some examples here. If you look to the left here, we've got a fixture that uh, is for the most part dark sky compliant from the two uh, to, to, the, to, uh, to the right and left of it. And then we've got some fixtures to the right here, the red ones specifically. You see these everywhere. Um, they're on garages, they're on your porches, whatever the case may be, the fixture is shining down. It, it's, it's focusing that light down. Whereas we've got the coach lamps and things of that nature, which I think most people have, unfortunately, including me until I changed it out. You know, again, you're seeing the bulb. That light is shining out, it's shining up. We wanna to try to move away from that fixture. And you can see that the good fixtures cost 29, 30, 40 dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's not a huge expenditure. It's a really pretty simple economical uh, fix for all of us. If we can go to the next slide. On the International Dark Sky website, they have examples for you as to which fixtures are dark sky compliant and which fixtures are not. And they will, if you pick a fixture, let's say, oh, I like that one. The, the, uh, the website will actually direct you to the store where you can buy it and then you can go and actually purchase it online. So they try to make it as easy as possible for you to make a difference with respect to the lights that you're using. Okay, let's go to the next one. Light bulbs. Um, so apart from turning the lights off, putting them on a dimmer, a timer, um, making sure they're shielded, uh, let's talk about light bulbs. Blue light, you might have heard me mention previously, the blue light is the big issue. The blue light is affecting the melatonin. The blue light is affecting our, our um, uh, circadian rhythms. The blue light is affecting our wildlife. The blue light is affecting our plants, okay? So when we go to the store, I don't know if everybody can see this on my little mm -hmm. screen, but um, you're going to want to look for a box that uh, uh, directs you to a Kelvin score. And you're going to want to look for something more in the 2700 Kelvin or 3000 Kelvin level. And, and those bulbs are more generally uh, labeled as soft white bulbs. 
So for outdoor use, you're gonna wanna look for soft white bulbs. And typically that's what you're gonna see on the packaging. Now there might be uh, a little information squares either up front or on the back of the box. It might specifically tell you the Kelvin score itself. Try to use 2700 if you can. Oh, there I am. Um, try to use 2700 if you can. So here's a soft one, okay? Stay away from this bad boy. You don't want to use a daylight bulb outdoors. It might be good for indoors. You may want to have it in the kitchen. You may want to have it in the basement, whatever the case may be. But you don't want to use a daylight bulb outdoors. This is a 5,000 Kelvin. It's a white light. And I think some of you have probably seen the difference. Um, that has all the blue light. So you want to stay away from 5,000. You want to stay away from 4,000. Unfortunately, a lot of our municipalities who kind of changed over to LED you know, quickly without knowing the consequences are using those 4,000 Kelvin bulbs, um, which of course has a huge detrimental effect. So, and these bulbs, don't, they don't check, they don't uh, cost anything more. Soft white costs the same as the daylight. Um, can we go back to a slide? Barb, can we go back to a slide? Did we lose Barb? Well, if I'm still alive, um, which I may or may not be, um, let me show you a little bit of what is a 5,000 Kelvin bulb. It's very white, it's very bright. Here it's in a shielded fixture, but it's just too bright, too much blue. Whereas with a soft white bulb, 2700, it's got a little more of a yellow tint to it. It's still very sufficient. It's gonna light what you need to have lit. It's gonna still provide you with all the safety that you you need um, at night to the extent that you need it. Again, in a shielded fixture, but it's, it's removing that blue light by the way they filter the bulb. Okay, well, I don't know if we're gonna have additional slides or not. So I guess to summarize on what we're gonna try to do to address light pollution at our homes, Again, we're gonna turn off those lights when we can. Um, if we wanna keep the lights on, try to focus on uh, timers, which work tremendously well. Um, dimmers, with LEDs, you can actually reduce um, the uh, brightness of the light uh, by dimming it. Whereas with the old Tommy Eds and the sodium lights, you couldn't do that well. But make sure the bulb that you buy actually say dimmable. So you can dim those lights by 50, 60% or whatever the case may be. Whatever, lit, whatever light you're gonna keep lit, make sure it's in that shielded fixture. There's a ton of beautiful fixtures available to you in lieu of a fixture that's not dark sky compliant. And then you're gonna to wanna to choose those soft white bulbs for outdoor use, 2,700 Kelvin, 3,000 at most. Stay away from anything more than that. That has the detrimental blue light. And if you can remember even more, try to find a 2700 or a 3000 bulb that has just 40 watts, which basically is equivalent of 450 lumens. That's a brightness scale. So you wanna keep that brightness down um, in addition to having uh, a better um, Kelvin score. Okay, so. Yeah, and I'm seeing from uh, Bar Bert, let me put my glasses on because at my age I can't read anymore. Apparently we've lost Bart. So since I'm a co-host, um, I guess to finish, um, I'll let you know that again, I'm with the IDA, the International Dark Sky Association, and you can go to uh, www.darksky.org to learn more. Here's Barb. And you're muted. Sorry, internet issue. Don't worry about it. I think we explained everything pretty well without additional slides.
Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so we went through uh, what we generally want to do with respect to uh, reducing light pollution at our individual homes. Mm -hmm. And then I just basically said, uh, I'm Adam Cruiser with the IDA, and you can you can check out the uh, IDA website. Okay. And, uh, I, I think we're at the point now where we can encourage some questions. So if you yeah. want to take back over. Excellent. Um, when I cut out on internet, I lost a couple of the chat. So um, I apologize if anyone, if I missed your question, please type it again. So the first question was, um, where in the United States is there one of the zone one uh, lowest light pollution sites? Yeah, well, um, I think most people will tell you the one, there, there's a place in Nevada, I don't recall the name of it. I believe there's another place in New Mexico, I don't recall the name of it, but most astro junkies are going to Utah. Okay. So, Go to uh, Moab. Um, uh, go to uh, Arches. Mm -hmm. uh, Zion. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're gonna see just incredible night sky. Most of the Facebook stuff that I do now um, is with a lot of uh, astro photo junkies. Yeah. And uh, Instagram too, and they're just exploding my Facebook page and my Instagram pages with uh, dark sky pictures and videos. And most of that's coming from Bend, Oregon. Okay. From, uh, Utah and places mm -hmm. like that. All right. Yeah, remembering back to your map that showed the progression of light over the years that was still dark out west. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Still dark, but not much longer if we don't take care of it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the other question was, are a lot of the slides that you showed this evening available on the International Dark Sky Association website? Um, I don't know if most of them are available. Um, uh, certainly a lot of them are available. Uh, now I believe this uh, webinar will be available on YouTube, Barb. Yeah, we're mistaken. recording it, yes. Um, yeah. So for those right. of you that are on here now, you'll be able to see it. Uh, so that's true. And you did mention that the sample letters for convincing your neighbors to turn their lights out was on the website. Uh, well, the, the um, IDA has actual uh, uh, samples that are different than mine. Right, right. Um, But if you go to, there's a site known as Go Green Illinois. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but they've already picked up on this dark sky issue and they've actually put my letters on their website so you can find them there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, there's also another webinar out of, of, of me out there. If you really wanna you know, get tired and bored, you can watch another webinar of me. Um, through the Conservation Foundation, and that has all the slides too. So right. if we missed a few because of our our internet issues, you can a little glitch. Slides. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, Josiah Josiah asks, what kind of research efforts are ongoing concerning light pollution, and what kind of research needs to be happening to fill the gaps in our current understanding of the issue? Yeah. Well, Barb, maybe you can answer that question because I know that you've been very much involved with that recently. Mm. Uh, well, in terms of plants, uh, we're really just starting to uh, tap into that entire story. So when I looked for research papers on the impact of light pollution on plants, there really weren't that many. But as I start reading more and seeing how impactful, you know, the uninterrupted length of darkness was to plant blooming, I think that uh, this is an area that we definitely need more research and uh, I hope to see more publications coming out in the near future. Yeah, and more broadly than that, you know, I don't think there's a coincidence, now call me jaded. I don't think there's a coincidence that this insect apocalypse and this bird apocalypse, and I know there's chemicals and, and other things that are involved and so on and so forth, but the timing of this apocalypse also is very much, maybe it's just coincidence, consistent with the explosion of light pollution. And what you're finding, and, and I think I might have mentioned this to Don before we started, um, I, because I'm a junkie with respect to this, I surf the internet weekly, at least weekly. And every week there's more publications, there's more studies that are available. People are really diving into this. The scientific community is really diving into this on the consequences to the, the health of plants, to the health of wildlife, and to us too. Mm -hmm. I think we're ultimately going to find that this light pollution, this blue light specifically, that we're introducing not just on our computer tablets and things of that nature that we look at before we go to bed, but what is coming into our bedroom windows 
is very much affecting our health, very much affecting our health. Mm -hmm. Melatonin is very important. So there's a lot of research going on now and you can pick that up um, if, you, if you just wanna Google. Look for artificial light at night, light pollution articles and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, did I did I miss anyone? Are there any other questions? Just type them in the chat if so. Otherwise, I think Adam, I think we've got to all of them. Uh, it's been a really great evening for those of you who stayed a little extra to, to listen to the chat. Thanks for for that. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I hope we'll see you at some future in-person programs. Uh, we hope to be able to bring Adam back and do one of those when the time is right. And uh, yeah, Adam, any last words? Well, yeah, hopefully, um, whether we're still wearing masks and doing some social distancing, uh, we might be able to have a program or two where we're actually getting outdoors and we're enjoying the night sky as we talk about the consequences of light pollution and so on. Um, but again, I, I can't underemphasize to everybody how important it is to address this and what an easy economical fix it is. This is one of the few things that we can do in a very simple way to address a very significant problem. Yeah, yeah, something that we can we can make an impact tonight when we, we get can. off of this call. We go turn off our outdoor lights. Yeah, well, I would encourage all of you to do that. Adam, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Barb. I appreciate it. Yeah. And good night, everybody. Good night. See everyone soon.